So, a few days ago, I reported on the fact that Star Trek Discovery Season 3 will introduce two characters in the transgender non-binary umbrella, which has me so excited, and I did a whole video on why I was excited, and why these characters are so important to me, to representation, and to the trans community, and to Star Trek in general. But since then, since that announcement has come out, there's been some criticisms, some good faith and well-intentioned, and as well as some that are not, about having trans and non-binary characters in Star Trek. That, in my opinion, I think completely misunderstands the importance of explicit representation, as well as what Star Trek actually is attempting to do as a franchise with these characters. So let's talk about it. And as usual, I'm going to talk about the good faith criticism first, because I want this video to try to engender positive, constructive, and educational conversation with people who actually want to have that engagement, even if they disagree with me, because that's what this channel is all about, about trying to engender positive, good conversation with people who may disagree, but can all come together to have nice, constructive conversations. How many times can I say the word conversation in a video? Don't worry though, we will briefly touch upon the bad faith criticisms later on in the video, and I'll make clear what my distinguishing feature is. The major good faith criticisms that have come out about having transgender and non-binary characters in Star Trek, and the fact that we are celebrating the fact that we are getting our first transgender and non-binary characters in Trek, are twofold. The first criticism is that the representation in Discovery isn't actually all that revelatory for Trek, because Star Trek has always had non-binary and transgender characters before this. And honestly, to a degree, that is true. There are numerous examples of this, though the top ones that come to mind are the Binars in the Next Generation episode 1001101, or whatever the hell that number was, or the Janai in the episode of The Outcast from Next Generation as well, or the Cogenitors in the episode Cogenitors of Star Trek Enterprise, or hell, going all the way back to even the very first episode of Star Trek ever produced with the Telosians in the episode The Cage. The argument can even be made that the shapeshifters in Deep Space Nine are also non-binary, because at one point they actually discuss how they don't know what gender is. Though I will say this in the Changelings case, while that may technically be true that they are technically genderless or non-gendered, uh, they do portray them as male and female exclusively. Hell, the main Changeling villain's name is literally female changeling, and Odo chose to live his life as a heterosexual male. But regardless of that, the biggest example though that everyone cites is obviously one of the main cast members from Deep Space Nine in the character of Dax, a trill symbiote that has passed from host to host throughout its life that brings along its memories of those past lives and can go into people of different genders. And while the only major on-screen Dax hosts that we got were both female, we do know of and occasionally even see previous hosts of Dax who were male. And Dax's best friend on the show, and the main character of Deep Space Nine, Sisko, remembers when Dax was a male host, Curzon, and even affectionately calls the female Jadzia Dax, old man. So here's the thing with that argument. In many ways, yes, these are representations of non-binary and transgender people that have existed in Star Trek before now. And they have 100% definitely been an important part in making transgender people like myself feel represented in a way that even other shows around at the same time that these shows are on the air didn't include trans people. I mean, there is a reason that my favorite character is Dax of all people in Star Trek. I mean, like, quite literally, let me disentangle myself here. Like. Literally, I have, this is one of numerous Dax merchandise that I have around my room. I have this one, I have another toy on the wall there. I even have a cardboard cutout of Dax just around the corner, creepily hiding. You can see it in some of my live stream videos. I don't want to drag it over here because there's a, there's a lot of wires going on right here right now. And you see, to me, as a trans person, Dax meant a ton to me. And Dax as a character, as well as other transgender non-binary representations in episodes like The Outcast and Cogenitor, often dealt with issues that transgender and non-binary people face, such as the Deep Space Nine episode Rejoined, where Dax meets their wife from a previous host and deals with issues similar to what many couples face when a transgender person decides to transition after they've already been married to someone. These representations did help trans people feel seen, and did help cis people, aka those who aren't transgender, maybe get a better glimpse of what it means to be trans, even if they didn't realize that the characters that they were watching were trans. But you see, that's kind of the problem right there. You see, with these representations, trans people looking to see ourselves always had to do a little bit of extra work. We had to try to find ways to read ourselves into the metaphor of these characters. To try to find what resonates with us in characters like Dax or the Janai in The Outcast. 
And we never got to actually see ourselves represented. And actual representation is important, explicit. Saying like this person is 100% trans and is a human trans person is incredibly important. I mean, there's a reason that Uhura and Sulu on the original series were so praised, because they were characters from minority groups that showed people that they could be part of this grand, beautiful future of Star Trek. Whoopi Goldberg herself, who appeared in Star Trek The Next Generation, spoke herself about how important Uhura was to let herself being seen as a black woman in the future of humanity. And that shows how important and revelatory Star Trek can be. That it can produce these wonderful affirmations and, 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 and galvanization of people in minority groups to say like, yes, we can be included in the future. That's the importance of Star Trek. But trans people have never explicitly gotten that. We've never had that moment. Sure, we may have been able to read ourselves into metaphors, but that's different than saying that we are 100% included in the future of Star Trek. It would be kind of like saying that because episodes like Let This Be Your Last Battlefield exist in the original series, which was a metaphor on how racial dynamics in the United States worked, that because that episode exists, we shouldn't have gotten the character of Uhura at all. Doing that would limit what black people can be, saying that their only importance to humanity is as a metaphor meant to teach others about black people's struggles and nothing more. Black people don't exist in service to teach others. They exist in and of themselves and deserve to just have a life separate from the struggles that they may face. And so too do trans people. And also the transgender and non-binary representations that existed before in Star Trek were not perfect. To be fair, the deny of the next generation and the cogenitor in Star Trek Enterprise were admirable callings for the understanding of trans people. But they also showed us as perpetually the victims. In fact, both the cogenitor and the Janai girl who wanted to be seen as a woman in that episode both had heartbreaking endings. The Janai girl was literally brainwashed by the end of the episode, and the cogenitor committed suicide. I was just told that the Vissian cogenitor died. What? How? Suicide trip. That's honestly heartbreaking to watch as a trans person to know that the only place I fit in in Star Trek is as a, a as someone who can only have a sad and heartbreaking ending. And yes, sure, those endings were important because they did help make people in the real world feel a need to want to ensure that those types of horrific things didn't continue to happen in our real world. Which, considering the issue of high suicidality rate in the trans community and the existence of conversion therapy camps are, that are real things in our real world that we need to fight against, that's something important to say and to do with Star Trek. But it also meant that transgender people only ever got to see ourselves be the victims within stories that were meant to teach others about ourselves, not something written for us. We never got to just be happy that we exist in the future, just as Uhura or Sulu or Kirk or Picard or Riker or Data or literally any other character or main cast member got to have. We deserve to see ourselves just existing in the future as ourselves, not as a teaching method for others, nor as a metaphor. It would honestly just be nice to know that I get to exist in the future and that my transness can be important or it might not be. Just to say, you know, like Cisco being a black man was important in a few times in Deep Space Nine, like in the episodes Past Tense or Far Beyond the Stars, but he also got to exist outside of being defined by his blackness. 90% of the time, he was just a commander on the station, and every so often, the fact that he was a black man came up and became relevant, but most of the time, it was irrelevant. In a similar way, in the end, trans people exist in the real fabric of the diversity of humanity, and therefore should be in TV shows and movies without having to be justified. But also, especially should be in a franchise that has sold itself from day one, from the very first episode of Star Trek as a show about, as Gene Roddenberry put it, taking delight in the difference of life forms. The whole show was an attempt to say that humanity will reach maturity and wisdom on the day that it begins not just to tolerate, but to take a special delight in differences in ideas and differences in life forms. We tried to say that the worst possible thing that can happen to all of us is for the future to somehow press us into a common mold where we begin to act and talk and look and think alike. If we cannot learn to actually enjoy those small differences, take a positive delight in those small differences between our own kind here on this planet, then we do not deserve to go out into space and meet the diversity that's almost certainly out there. But the second criticism, though, jumps off of this idea in an interesting way, and one that I kind of think is really sort of cool, even if I mildly disagree. 
You see, it's argued that trans people wouldn't even exist in the future of Star Trek, or at the very least wouldn't be a big deal worth talking about, because by the time we got to the Star Trek future, medical technology and morality of that future would advance so much that to transition wouldn't be that hard, nor would it be stigmatized. So people would just transition either earlier in life or whenever they wanted to, and no one would talk about it or make a big deal about it. I mean, we even kind of see that this is true in the episode Prophet and Lace from Deep Space Nine, where Quark transitions to being a woman and transitions back to being a man surgically, and it's no big deal. It's an elective procedure that Dr. Bashir apparently does in an afternoon and has no real lasting concerns or worries about or has lasting medical issues for Quark. So many Star Trek fans have argued, why do we even need an explicit transgender character? Because trans people aren't all that big a deal in the Star Trek future anyways. Hell, maybe a character we've already seen in Star Trek was trans and we just didn't even know it. And I will say that's a really cool thought and something that I hope does happen in the future of Star Trek. In fact, let's use a specific hypothetical example. If Star Trek Voyager, for example, had ever done a scene where, let's say, Harry Kim got to have a flashback sequence and we saw that as a young child, young Mr. Kim was actually born seen as a girl, and nothing is ever made of that fact, it's not even brought up as a significant issue or problem, and it's just inferred that Harry Kim decided to transition at some point, that is something I 100% would have praised as subtle and beautiful representation of the transgender community in the future of Star Trek. It would be a great way to normalize and show this idea that trans people exist in the future of Star Trek, but with advanced medical technology and the Federation's morality having evolved so much that no one cares and it's not a big deal. That's something that would be absolutely fan freaking tastic, and I would love that. But you see, the problem is, Star Trek never did that scene. They never even inferred it. This idea that trans people would just exist in Star Trek is not a new idea, by the way. You see, trans people like myself have already had canon that for a long time. It's something I've thought about the Trek universe for a long time, and that's something I just decided before even they announced these characters in Discovery that I just assumed was true about the Trek world. But you see, again, it goes back to the fact that we have to do the work of trying to see where we would fit in the nooks and crannies and gaps in the story. Because you see, Star Trek is not a documentary of the future, as much as I wish that were true. Star Trek is a show that was written today and is meant to reflect our real world today. Certainly, Star Trek uses metaphors to talk about issues of today, but it also always attempted to explicitly show the diversity of humanity in the future. It's 100% true, I wouldn't want trans people in the future of Star Trek to have to face the stigma of prejudice or transphobia that trans people face today. Like if Captain Picard or, you know, Starfleet crew members started going around saying, screw trans people, I hate them, I would call 100% BS on that because that's not something that fits in the ethos of Star Trek and no Star Trek character would do that. At least that's not what I believe. And it's why I believe episodes like Cogenitor and The Outcast are important because they show that trans people wouldn't face stigma by Starfleet, but use aliens instead to talk about that stigma all the same, without saying that humanity of the future would carry that transphobia or prejudice forward 300 years from now. But we also should get to actually see explicit trans people exist in Star Trek. Star Trek doesn't get to not talk about transgender people at all and then get brownie representation points for people outside of the actual show in real life saying, maybe they were always there and you just didn't know it. Because explicitly seeing yourself represented in something is incredibly important. I talked about Uhura, but let's use another example from Star Trek, Geordi LaForge. Outside of the fact that Geordi was a black man, he was also a great representation of the disabled community. Jordy is even named after a real-life disabled Trek fan who passed away before Star Trek The Next Generation came out. And the disabled community got to see themselves reflected in Jordy. There are scenes in Star Trek The Next Generation where Jordy wishes he could see Tasha Yar with his actual eyes, for example. Or in Star Trek Insurrection where he talks about how wonderful it is for him to actually see with his eyes again after they've recovered due to the planetary gas that caused his eyes to regrow in that movie. You know I've never seen a sunrise. At least... Not the way you see them. These are moments where him being explicitly blind allowed disabled people to see tiny moments where their issues are shown directly within a character that they love. And 90% of the time, he's just Jordy, treated like anybody else. But those moments where that part of him got to be highlighted was incredibly important to the disabled community. Jordy's importance to the disabled community, some mistakes and issues with his character notwithstanding, cannot be understated. And I want that same feeling for the transgender community as a whole. I want us, I want myself, to feel seen in Star Trek. If I'm being fully honest with all of you, I'm honestly prepared to cry when I watch the first Star Trek Discovery episode with those transgender and non-binary characters in it. 
Because just seeing that I get to exist in Star Trek's future, knowing for 100% sure that I can exist in that beautiful future, that I'm a part of it, will mean so much to me. Yes, I had Dax, and I loved her so much. She was so important to my, you know, growing up and understanding that I was a trans person as a kid. But I can't help but feel so excited for myself and for all the younger trans folks or transgender people who aren't out yet, who will feel seen and galvanized by this representation within Star Trek Discovery. To show that, despite our struggles today, we will still exist and still get to be part of humanity's bright future. And yes, I totally understand how it can seem weirdly counterintuitive to say we want to normalize trans people, that we want to make us feel seen like we're normal in the future, and the way that we go about doing that is actually over-highlighting transgender people specifically. I understand that that seems kind of weird and, and against the point. Shouldn't the way to normalize trans people just to make us seem every day? Just a normal part of Star Trek? So why make a big deal of it? Why, why focus on the transgender and non-binary people? Well, Sadly, we are not at that point in our actual real world. We are not at the point where we can just accept on faith that transgender people exist. Again, Star Trek is not a documentary, but a show born out of the times in which it was made. And today, because transgender and non-binary people have been so politicized by today's culture, we need to take moments to celebrate trans people where they get to exist and make sure that we take the extra time to make sure that we actually include trans people in these things. Ideally, yes, it would be great if we didn't have to talk about these issues at all, and that we shouldn't have to argue about justifying transgender people's place in Star Trek. We should just get to exist, or it should not just be a big deal, or we shouldn't have to worry about it. But that's not where we are as a culture right now in the real world, as sad as that is to say. Transgender people face real problems and real stigmatization and real politicization. And so we need to talk about that fact. We need to push that fact in our stories because our stories show us what we can be. That's what Star Trek is, a show that shows us what we can be. And we need to make sure that showing us what we can be includes trans people. Because trans people are part of the beautiful diversity of life, of what our future of humanity can be. And so Star Trek as a franchise, using its platform to show and highlight the things that we need to talk about today, that is something that the show has always done. And I hope that they don't make a big deal out of the trans characters within the actual show of Star Trek. Like, I don't want the characters in the show going around saying, Hey, I'm transgender. Look at me, I'm trans. Hey, nice to meet you. Didn't you know I'm transgender? That would feel over the top, and I will be the first person to criticize that. I want these characters to be like Uhura, for example, or to use an even more recent um, representation, like Paul Stemets and Hugh Culber in Star Trek Discovery. A couple that was treated just like any other couple within the universe of Discovery and Star Trek, with no one caring or being bothered by the fact that they were gay. That's how I hope the trans characters are treated in Star Trek Discovery as well, just getting to exist. But outside of Star Trek, we are not at that place yet. And so the few chances we have to have transgender people represented in a show we care about needs to be celebrated until hopefully one day it won't be a big deal to have a transgender character. But we're not there yet. But as Star Trek says, we can get there if we fight for it. Now, sadly, I do want to briefly touch upon something that is a little less positive. You see, these arguments that I've been talking about have mostly come from well-meaning folks who don't have an issue with transgender people specifically, but just have raised their concerns about what they saw as potential issues with having transgender people explicitly represented in Star Trek. I disagree with you, and I hope I made my points clear and maybe even convinced a few of you, but I also understand that some people who may not have been exposed to transgender people or have had a chance to understand the importance of what explicit representation would mean to us in Star Trek might be concerned how that explicit trans representation might be something that breaks the canon or storytelling cohesiveness of their favorite franchise. Now, like I said, I don't think explicit trans representation does that, and even if it did, I would say that representing trans people is more important than the storytelling cohesiveness of a fictional world. I mean, if we want to get technical about it, according to the original series episode Turnabout Intruder, we shouldn't even have female captains in represented in Star Trek before Captain Kirk. Your world of starship captains doesn't admit women. It isn't fair. But we all just ignore that because it's more important to show women characters getting to be a part of the future leadership of humanity than it is to remain true to that particular piece of pre-existing canon in the Trek universe. It's more important for representation than to adhere to some weird canon laws and specifics. 
I, and again, I don't think that transgender people break the canon of Star Trek, but even if they did, I think it's more important to include trans people than it is to worry about the specific canon of the show. Just my opinion. But again, I understand why some people may disagree with that, especially people who aren't as exposed to trans issues. But unfortunately, some people have used these good faith arguments in order to do something more problematic to capitalize on these legitimate, if, in my opinion, misguided, concerns in order to wield them in service of something more insidious. And let me show you what I mean by that distinction. You see, bad faith criticism starts from the same exact place, going through the arguments that, oh, Star Trek has always had trans people, or that trans people wouldn't be a big deal and don't need to be seen explicitly in Star Trek. But then they take that argument a single step further, they use these arguments to say that because these things about the Star Trek universe are, to their mind, true, that a new Star Trek show having explicit transgender and non-binary representation means that the writers of the show are trying to force transgender representation onto you. That it's this SJW agenda trying to ruin your Star Trek by using trans people as tokens to de destroy the fabric and integrity of the Star Trek universe and push this weird liberal agenda. Now, as I hope I elucidated with my previous comments, yes, this may be an agenda to push transgender people, but it's one that's well within fitting within what Star Trek has always tried to do. But this argument that these bad faith actors use gets into what I was talking about in a recent video that I did on the fandom menace. These arguments get tied together to go down a rabbit hole of something much darker. It goes from, quote, trans people don't need to be represented in Star Trek, to then to the next point that this ruins Star Trek, to the next point, which is saying this ruining of Star Trek is an explicit agenda to ruin Star Trek. And then all that gets extrapolated into the next step, that the creators of the show are trying to actively destroy something you love, trying to actively destroy Star Trek, and that trans people are the weapon that they are using to do it. And then that anger that has now galvanized with that argument, which is not true, as I hope I have elucidated, that anger then gets wielded to be brought down upon not only the writers of Star Trek, but those who like this current era of Star Trek, and even worse, trans people as a whole. It goes from, the writers are ruining the Star Trek I love, to, they must be doing that because they hate me or hate the thing I like, to, I hate those writers too, to, I am angry at the people who like this new Star Trek because I think it is ruining the franchise that I love, and they don't understand that to then saying, I'm angry with those people and I'm angry with trans people for pushing their agenda in a way that ruins the thing I love. It's riding this wave of anger in order to instill hatred rather than engendering constructive conversation. And that has real consequences, not only for Star Trek, but more importantly, has real consequences for the Star Trek community as a whole and the trans community within Star Trek in specific. It creates an attitude of us versus them. I mean, look at so many conversations I've had on Twitter where people argue back and forth, trying to one-up each other, trying to say, I'm right, you're wrong, you don't understand Star Trek, rather than actually trying to discuss the issue at hand, rather than trying to have a constructive conversation, they're just trying to win. And because of that, because there's this toxic fighting between ourselves, it makes people feel uncomfortable within the Trek community and pushes many people back into their echo chambers. They don't want to deal with you, they just want to go back into their own little safe community because they just get so tired with having to deal with all these annoying arguments and be Yes, it's frustrating and tiring, and I totally understand it. Yet these conversations do something even worse. They make transgender people in specific feel unsafe. When you see people constantly arguing about trans people don't shouldn't be in Star Trek, or trans people are ruining my like Star Trek for me, when trans people constantly see that being talked about over and over and over again, it's totally understandable why they would say, like, maybe I don't want to be in the Star Trek fandom. Maybe I don't want to be here. If people don't want me here, if I constantly have to fight just to justify my own existence within a thing that I like, then why do I even want to be a part of it? Why do I want to tire myself out all the damn time talking about this? I mean, I love Star Trek, and even I feel this from time to time. It's like, I had to sit up today to write this video for all of you, and that takes time and effort on my part, and it just gets tiring. I'd rather sit here and have made a video about, like, oh my gosh, isn't this cool, like, nerdy thing in Star Trek something really fun that we can all talk about and enjoy? No, I have to spend the time to actually sit here and talk to you about why transgender representation is important. And that's something I like doing, but it can get tiring over and over and over again and can make other trans people feel really pushed out and upset. I understand it. As I said, it's easy for this inciting of anger to descend into blaming transgender people for the problem. And even if it's not your intent to hate on trans people as a group, it can make trans people feel pushed out and disillusioned with the Trek community anyways. And that pushes trans people out of our community and lessens the diverse community that Trek has always tried to engender. 
And it makes those who are left in the Trek community get less exposure to new identities and new ideas, and makes the Trek community become more insular and echo chambery. And that lessens you. It lessens you because you are lessening the community. This fighting, this ideas lessens all of us. It lessens trans people because we don't get to get exposed to Star Trek, which is something that I think is a beautiful work of art. And it lessens the Trek community because it doesn't allow us to just meet other people, to, to enjoy the diverse beauty that is the Trek community. Trek should always be a place that welcomes others, that welcomes all people. It's infinite diversity and infinite combinations. And to go back to the very root of this bad faith criticism, the whole concept of it is flawed because the writers of Star Trek are not trying to hate on fans or ruin Star Trek. In fact, quite the opposite. They're trying to reflect the exact idea that Star Trek was built on, infinite diversity and infinite combinations within the Trek show itself. Because that makes Star Trek a truer reflection of what humanity actually is. And for sure, we can criticize how well they write the stories and if they get the transgender representation right. Don't you worry, I'll be right here on this channel reviewing every single episode of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, and I will be the first person to either alternatively praise or criticize the show's story choices as well as the trans representation on the show. But the basic fact of transgender people and non-binary people getting to be in Star Trek is not an attack on Star Trek, nor does it ruin Star Trek. It instead continues and improves the legacy of what Star Trek has always worked to do. Show us a better future of humanity that we all get to be a part of. Thank you all so much for watching that. I actually got much more uh, heated and... Uh, emotional, <laughs> uh, to use that word, um, in this video than I actually anticipated doing. Um, I actually added a few things that weren't in my script. Uh, hopefully it all made sense. Hopefully I made the point clear about why it's important to have transgender people in Star Trek and in the Trek community as a whole. Um, so yeah, so uh, if you liked this video and want more discussions of Star Trek and why representation and other social and political issues in Star Trek are important, don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Um, also, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below. Please, uh, I, I just let's keep it in good faith. Let's keep it respectful. But please feel free to disagree with me. Just always come at it with a place to be constructive, not destructive. I just want to be kind of clear on that. Just please, again, disagree with me if you will. But just come at it from a place of trying to be constructive, not destructive. And especially not destructive to other people in the comments. Attack me all you want. I really don't care. If you want to say I'm a stupid, dumb idiot, whatever. I'll get over it. That's just being a person on the internet. Whatever. Please don't attack other people in the comments. That That's what really, really bugs me. Um, but yeah, subscribe, comment. I have some podcasts. You can check those out. Those will be in the descriptions. But beyond all of that stuff, oh, and I also have a Patreon. Don't forget to help me over on Patreon if you uh, want to help me continue doing these videos and helping um, me do better with these videos um, and get yourself some own cool perks. But again, beyond all that stuff, beyond subscribing, commenting, and, and Patreon stuff, I just hope that you, as always, live long and prosper, you beautiful, amazing people, no matter who you are or what your identity is. Thank you so much to all of my patrons, especially Ashley Allen Bokikio, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Moss, Ashlyn Solstice, Christina Dalliance, Greg Gillum, Stephen Clinard, Munir Amlani, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Wayne Twitchell, Ish the Mad, Buttoneer, Randy Thompson, Jemshin, Lorena Mesa, Mari Neckar, Wellington Marcus, John Steele, Michael Beam, William Stewart, Gavin Robinson, Jason Knott, Maeve, Sabraxis, Tonya Trummer, Wen Dizzle Bizzle, Gretchen Badger, Dante St. James, Polly Mina, Piston Twisted Garage, and Bree Beecher. Thank you all so much for your continued support.